Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for attending the Women and Girls Research Alliance 2022 Research and Practice Discussion Series, Pathways to Economic Empowerment Entrepreneurship. My name is Dr. Michelle Meggs, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Women and Girls Research Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us today for what will be an exciting and informative discussion. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes just to introduce our panel and then I am going to get out of the way. I just want to remind our attendees that you can post your questions in the chat throughout the discussion. Um, and then we will address all of your questions as quickly as we can as we move throughout the discussion. Our participants today, uh, first I want to introduce Ms. Rocio Gonzalez, who serves as the Executive Director of the Women's Business Center of Charlotte, followed by Stacy Cassio, who is the founder and CEO of the Pink Mentor Network. Next is Sherry Waters, who is the owner and operator of the Pauline T. Bar Apothecary followed by Laura Smales, who is the Assistant Director of Venture Prize here at UNC Charlotte. And last but certainly not least, our moderator for today's discussion, Arissa Elamin, who is the owner of Arissa Elamin Consulting. Again, I will turn it over to our moderator, Arissa Elamin, and again, you can post your questions in the chat. And at the end of our discussion, please stay tuned to take our very brief survey. Arissa, I place it in your hands. Thank you, Dr. Meggs. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to thank Natasha for your support and making sure that we were all connected. We really appreciate you. Um, I am so excited to be your moderator for today. As Dr. Meg said, my name is Arisa Elamine and I'm the owner of Arisa Elamine Consulting. I uh, work with individuals, organizations, and teams to improve and change for the better. I am so excited to be talking with you today about entrepreneurship. Uh, the goal for today is to really talk about the different ways, the pathways to economic empowerment for women. And, you know, this is Women's History Month, so um, we have a great discussion here for you today. The goal of today really is to talk about what the different pathways are for women um, and using entrepreneurship to really build that economic independence and agency. Um, I have many questions for our panelists and um, Dr. Meggs gave a brief introduction. I am actually going to, with my first question, invite our panelists to provide some more information about themselves as they discuss um, when it comes to business and career, um, you know, we're often encouraged to think about our big why, you know, why we do what we do, what our purpose is. And so, you know, when we think about entrepreneurship, I'd like for each of you to share with us your journey, your career journey, your professional journey, and what uh, led you to be able to support uh, women and others with regard to entre entrepreneurship. So I will start with Rocio Gonzalez and then we'll move down the line. Thank you, Arisa. And thank you so much to the Women's and Girls Research Alliance for um, having this event and inviting us. My name is Rocio Gonzalez. I am a, uh, what I call a New York Tana. I was born in New York and I grew up in Bogota, Colombia. So um, even though I am a USA citizen, my native language is uh, Spanish um, and uh, <clears throat> began to learn English at the age of 18 or 19. And um, I uh, love Colombia, I love the Latino culture. And I also, <clears throat> excuse me, love um, the American culture and where I am. I feel the United States is my home. So from an early age of my career and of my studies, I realized that um, it was really my passion, my purpose and, and my enjoyment to help 
my American friends understand the Latino culture, what we eat, what we like, what we dance, how we say things and how many things are in common. The same as the Latinos here in the United States, I wanted to help them understand the American ways, uh, football and baseball and things like that and the food and the places. So all along in my career, I have noticed that wherever I am, I'm uh, the advocate for those that need support in accessing uh, equality. So um, I was a child abuse investigator and translated for many families that were dealing with the legal system and with the uh, services systems. Um, when I moved from Pennsylvania to um, the North Carolina region, I was a real estate agent and I helped many families uh, go through the mortgage and finding a home and insurance and all those different um, uh, things that they needed to go through to become a, a homeowner. Um, and then with the Latin American Chamber of Commerce, I began to advocate for small businesses um, so that they would also have equal access to education, to capital, to resources, to networking. And now that I am involved with the Women's Business Center of Charlotte, I feel that this um, position really fulfills my purpose because it allows me to continue to support entrepreneurs, to support women-owned businesses, to help them make the contacts that are necessary for them to succeed and help them uh, connect with resources as wonderful as the other ladies that you have right here, you know? Uh, so I'm very, very excited to, to, where, to be where I am. And I feel that my business is to ensure that your business um, flourishes and survives and thrives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Rocio. Laura? Yeah, my, again, Laura Smales. I'm the Assistant Director at VenturePrize, and we are the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center here on campus. And we do a variety of programming. Um, so one of our main uh, focuses is uh, sort of having foundational programming. It's called Customer Discovery, where we're really um, trying to assist faculty and um, graduate students and some undergraduate students in their research. So they're doing this amazing work here on campus. And we're actually having them go through programming to see how their research and how their innovation can um, make an impact, make a change in, in the community, out in the real world. So we um, have them go out and actually talk to industry leaders, potential customers, competitor, you know, and actually go out and figure out what problems are being faced in an industry and you know, is my research, is my solution really fitting that? Um, because that's a huge foundational um, necessity that you need to have when you start a business, when you commercialize, you really want to be solving a problem. And that program is supported by the National Science Foundation. We, are a, we were one of the first um, back in 2014 of the National, Fi uh, National Science Foundation i sites. So we're, we're uh, wrapping up that program specifically, but we always continue to do that customer discovery. Uh, process. And then we also offered that to community um, founders as well. We became an NC IDEA uh, ecosystem partner and they funded us to be able to have that customer discovery um, program for community founders as well. And so we've worked with over, I think, 150 teams off campus in the community and over 300 teams on campus. So it's been a, a very active program that we're very proud of. And uh, we also work with a lot of students. One of our main priorities is really empowering students with the tools and resources to be able to make an impact. How do you wanna make a change? You know, what problems are you seeing? You know, whether it's on campus, in the community, national internet, what problems are you really interested in and how can you make that difference? And so we take them through um, a series of workshops and different ideas, you know, how can this make an impact? You know, let's let's focus on a problem and how can you make that change? So, you know, they do that foundational programming of that fit and go through and we, we fund them and uh, have them go through different things to really be able to make an impact and lead. And it's really important to empower students with that entrepreneurial mindset. Um, to really look at problems in a different way, to have that critical thinking, to have those problem solving skills, because no matter what they do, once they leave campus, um, whether they become an, a, a founder, whether they work in a corporation, whether they start a nonprofit, um, having that entrepreneurial mindset is very important. Um, and a lot of, you know, different, the workforce is looking for those types of qualities. So we have a couple of different um, you know, programs where they can go through and, and really get these skills. 
Um, so that's something that we're also doing on campus. And then one of our newest programs that I'm really excited about is we started looking, um, uh, last year we started looking at the landscape of the Charlotte ecosystem, the not the, the found, you know, founders and startup resources. And there is a lack of female and other minority led companies. And when you look at that problem, you actually see that it starts with leadership. Um, so there's, there's a lack of leaders, you know, lack of leadership that people are raising their hands and, and being able to say, I will help in this field. I will, I will do that. So we um, became, we actually got a grant from NC Idea, um, and it is to launch what we just did last summer and we'll do again this summer. It's called the um, Inclusive Innovation Leadership Academy. And we had 18 participants come through the first time around. And these are leaders in the community, um, whether it's in marketing, HR, finance, um, anything, you know, and what we're doing is teaching them how to work with entrepreneurs in the community. So they have these great resources and they have this expertise, but now we're going, we're training them to be able to work with founders in our ecosystem. That's so we've just graduated 18 of those and we're excited for them. They've been out in the community and working with some of the non, uh, some of the startup organizations here in Charlotte, and we're getting some really great feedback and look forward to launching our second one this summer as well. Um, I was an entrepreneur, right? But I actually went through venture prize programming. I actually met two engineers while I was getting my master's degree here at UNC Charlotte, and we started a company. So I believe in the programming and understand how important customer discovery is. And, um, but then it also gave me a passion to really focus on, you know, especially female leaders and female founders and really, really talking because I think a lot of, I see a lot of female founders and a lot of my students, I work with a lot of students that everything has to be perfect before they present or before they talk about an idea. And I really want to encourage and empower, um, you know, people to say, you know, this is my idea. This is what I'm seeing right now. Let's talk through it and really empower them with those skills. So I think there's where I started. Um, I started that and I, do I go ahead and answer? I just saw a question pop up. Do I answer that? <laughs> Sorry. Well, let me get through the rest Okay, perfect. That's perfect. I wanted to make sure. That. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the passion that both you and Rocia bring to this. I'd like to hear from Sherry next, Sherry Waters, um, because you have um, been in many different environments. And um, the question I have that I think touches on a bit of what Laura mentioned was around um, not only women, but also girls in getting into entrepreneurship. So I'm interested in hearing about your why. Um, and I also know that your um, daughters have been engaged with your business. So I'd love to hear you talk about um, your passion and your big why and why you decided to start your business and your involvement of your, your daughters in your business. Thank you. Um, it is an honor to be uh, in this um, circle of uh, dynamic women and uh, guests um, on this um, call today. I'm Sherry Waters. My background the, over the last 28 years has been in the nonprofit world doing uh, marketing and PR and friend raising. Um, so I started um, and um, a consulting INA LLC in 2018 to do personal stewardship coaching and consulting with individuals looking for an opportunity to steward everything that they've been given, their expertise, their, their ex education, their experiences um, to uh, birth their vision and dreams. Um, so in that time, I also, um, had the opportunity to go back to school and um, get my master's in practical theology with a focus on spiritual care and counseling. Um, it was during that time that I um, went and, and completed a residency as a chaplain as a part of my graduation uh, requirement was to do a, a chaplain uh, internship, which turned into a residency uh, with now Atrium Health. Um, there is where I had the idea of starting um, a social entrepreneurship project that will allow people um, and community members to have a place of respite and, and support in uh, such a, a hurried, chaotic world and community. So I launched the Pauline T. Bar Apothecary in um, July of 2019. 
I would not have, to your point, uh, Arisa, I would not have had the, had the opportunity to do that without the help of my daughters. Um, at that time, um, my uh, daughter, uh, one was finishing up grad school, um, so she needed something light <laughs> to do, uh, or she thought it was light uh, to before finishing her um, her MSW, and then my baby girl was in high, starting high school, and doing online classes. So both of them have been very integral to us launching the Pauline Tea Bar and curating a space for people to come and find respite and enjoy herbal tea. Um, I we opened our second location of the Pauline Tea Bar Apothecary just this uh, past December. Um, and we are, my 17 year old high school student is managing that as she is also um, doing her online high school classes. Um, so this has been a wonderful journey, um, social entrepreneurship. And um, I get to do the consulting and the, the spiritual care uh, support that I do for clients in uh, my office here at the T-Bar. Thank you so much, Sherry. And you know, um, your place is such a warm, welcoming community space that's been, I think, a respite for, for many people. So um, thank, you. thank you, thank you so much. So next we have Stacy uh, Cassio. Um, the question is still the same, just wanting to know your big why and um, how you got to from, you know, idea to actually starting up your mentoring, uh, initiative. I echo the gratitude uh, everyone else extended here. It's, um, I'm very grateful to get the opportunity to share this story because it took me 38 years to figure out why I was on this earth. And then two more to believe it because I was like every other woman filled with self-doubt. And then two more to realize, wow, I can make money. Not only can I make money, but I can do better than I did in corporate America. And I can grow those around me and create opportunity for them. So my journey is uh, really entrepreneurship found me. All happy accident, but terrifyingly scary. I was the head of engineering for a manufacturing company five years ago. And it was an opportunity introduced to me by a mentor. I always had this great skill set where I could meet people, develop relationships, and then um, produce enough results and, and some trust in that relationship where they would say, hey, I have an opportunity for you. And that kept going. That was like the transition of all of my career jumps and how I was moving industries and how I was moving organizations. And then all of a sudden I follow a mentor to a truck bumper manufacturer. And I look around and in all these rooms, I was the only woman. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, man, if I had my, my mentor had actually uh, moved into another part of the organization. So she wasn't quite as available to me. And so I thought, wow, how do I find that relationship? And because it wasn't available inside the company, I started Pink Mentor Network. And at, at that time, it was just my own need. I was looking for the mentor that was going to help bring opportunity to whatever was next. And it started with events. The events attracted a very loyal following. And I started seeing the same people coming to the monthly events. And I started thinking, okay, mentorship is so antiquated. And if I can study and research all of the reasons why people come into these spaces at what place they are in their career, how they're using this tool, maybe I could recreate a different model of mentorship. And five years later, that model of mentorship now exists and I help organizations utilize what the women of the Queen City showed me, how to create those frameworks inside their organizations and their companies in order to provide internal mobility for women in male-dominated industries. And it's the whole thing has been 
you know, I think entrepreneurship is really kind of the grand experiment. You test a few things, you take what works and you apply them to tomorrow. And, and that's how five years later I have gotten here. So I'm really excited to share this story. And if there are potential entrepreneurs on this call, you know, just take the steps. Small steps every day lead to big things. Do it. Do it scared. Just do it. Thank you so much for that. That's, um, that's great encouragement. I do have a question for you before we go back to Laura to pick up the question in the chat. Stacy, what type of mentoring um, do you think that women need uh, with the career versus entrepreneurship? Is it the same? Is it different? Yeah, so what I found in the mentorship model that I created was there are six times in our careers where we need mentorship. And if we can pair versus the pain point instead of pairing individuals, it's gonna be more sustainable. And those are anytime you're starting, anytime you're leading, anytime you're stepping up as the expert, anytime you're innovating, anytime you're growing, and when you just need to survive. So those six times are so powerful, but for an entrepreneur, they look different than someone who may be an employee in, in an organization because you're starting uh, and you're figuring out how to do this. Your start is different. You're starting a business and then you're stepping up into the expert role. Well, that also means being a consultant, solving someone else's problems, selling yourself in that way. Then you're growing your brand, your revenue. So it's, it's not that the pain points are different. It's just a different flavor. So it's not a whole different food group. It's just a different flavor. And I think one of the most powerful um, resources for entrepreneurs is your peer uh, group, because you are an island of one when you are starting something new. But there are a lot of other islands out there. And if you can connect with them, you can ban your resources together and pull each other forward. So I, I really think strong um, peer mentoring is important for entrepreneurship. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, and Laura, with the question in the chat, how does one become a part of the program as a leader? Um, and can you pick up a bit on uh, what Stacy was saying around um, the mentoring or the support that the program provides? So a huge feedback that we got, and I'm so glad you you spoke about that, Stacey, because I followed your, you know, I, I followed your your um, path. I have loved watching your milestones, have gotten excited and celebrated with you every time you've had one of those huge, you know, huge hits. So I, it's been a pleasure to, to, to be a part of watching that as well. But what we what we really try to do in this leadership academy is coaching versus consulting. And it's a huge difference. Um, and so we really try to look at that coaching aspect of it. And that was actually what inspired a lot of our, our uh, program participants last time is understanding that difference. We're talking about, and it's really just like uh, Stacy was talking about, like all these different islands that you're on, all these different milestones that you're trying to hit and what you're trying to become an expert in. We're really coaching, we're really helping these mentors that, you know, that are gonna go out into the community not necessarily say, here's your path, but empower them with the tools to walk somebody through that and say, here are some of the options. Here's what you, know, you need to look at and you know, take that different step, asking them questions. And then the answer is what's fed for their next steps. So it's really like understanding that path. And with entrepreneurship, it's such a bumpy ride. And you have to be able to take the lows, take the highs and really you know, go forward. And I've seen it as females, we want to do everything. And it's very hard for us to say, I need help. I need help with this. And I, you want to try to conquer it yourself. Well, when you're one, you know, which is a lot, you know, there's a lot of solopreneurs out there. Um, it's really, really difficult sometimes to manage all of it and have a family, and, you know, and do all of this. So it's really about finding that network and understanding what your resources are and utilizing that for different things. When I started my company, I knew nothing. I was, a, I had been a radio talk show producer for 12 years in my prior career. So I had no clue how to start a company and not nonetheless, one that was an engineering project, um, you know, was, it was based in, you know, so, you know, but I knew how to interview. I knew how to do the customer discovery. 
um, because with being a producer, you're, you're talking to a lot of people. So it was really like discovering all of those options and, and getting excited about that and finding that mentor network and, and, and really like tapping into that. So I think that's such a valuable uh, quality to have, you know, like and find when, when you're in this, because it's, it's sometimes hard to say, I need help with this. And then also you don't know what you don't know when you're starting a company. Um, being an entrepreneur is like, wait, what? I have to do that? <laughs> and so again, like, and so, and then just to answer really quick the question, um, there's my email. I just posted that, but we'll start promoting the program within the next couple of weeks. And um, definitely we'd love to, you know, we have an application process and we'll have all that information, but it really is, you know, for anybody that's an expert, you know, out in the field and you really want to, you really want to learn and understand how to work with entrepreneurs. I I, I'm really excited about this program. I, that's one of my favorite things that I, we're doing right now. So um, I look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you. Next question is uh, for Rocio. Rocio, um, uh, I'll mention this. So I um, am loving this conversation. I started out, uh, I grew up in a family owned business. And when I moved to Charlotte, not only was I supporting small business owners, but I was baking cakes and selling them on the side. <laughs> so I want to talk about the pathway to entrepreneurship. Sometimes it doesn't start big. It could start, you know, selling cupcakes out of, you know, out of your kitchen or, you know, making waist beads or making candles or what have you. What, um, what is the difference between kind of starting out small as a, a self-employed person versus growing to becoming um, a business that employs others? What, what are those steps or phases and what kind of resources um, do, does your organization provide at those different levels? Thank you. Wow, that is a very strong question. Very, very uh, multifaceted. I'm going to try to answer it as short as I can. Um, typically, there are two to three reasons why someone wants to start a business because they have uh, an idea, perhaps they have this something that they just keep on dreaming about and they would like to develop it into a money generating activity. Uh, those that um, are tired of working and they feel or think that being an entrepreneur is going to give them a lot of freedom, a lot of free time and tons of money right away. Um, you know where that's going to take them. And then um, another one, um, people that have gone through a long uh, journey of experience in the workforce and now they feel that they have enough capacity and know-how to, to kind of begin their own journey and now they need support in having access to capital and deploy that. So um, the answer to your question is that um, most all businesses start small. They need to be developed. They uh, need to have a business plan. They need, to ha they need to have a written business plan because that person that wants to either start a, an idea or, or open another business that has already been functioning or purchasing a business that is running already, they need to fully understand what is the knowledge that I have, what are my capacities and, capacities, and what are the other things that I need to hire out so that I can scale my business. So for example, in your, in your example of, of baking cakes, um, you drove to the supermarket, you purchased the, the, the items, you came home, you cooked them, you called your friends, you wrapped them, you took them there, you sold them and you took the money. So if you are happy with doing that with five or 10 cakes a week, then that is the business that you can have. And you can have that as your, your side money or, or something that you want to continue to do. But if you are planning on scaling that business, then you need to figure out, okay, so what is the time that is going to take me to buy the product, to produce the product, to market the product, to do the, the customer discovery, to do the product pricing, to do the delivery, to um, collect the, the, the payment. Is it going to be online? Is it going to be by check? Am I selling my products online? Am I delivering them? Am I asking my customers to come and pick them up? Are they coming to my house or are they coming to now a, um, uh, an industrial kitchen that I was able to rent to go into mass production? So just that one idea of 
I want to bake something and sell it to my friends can remain as a small business or can grow and flourish as big as you want it to be. You could sell little coffee cups here or turn into a Starbucks. Um, there are some people that have a large amount of money and they would like to become an entrepreneur. Perhaps purchasing a franchise is a good idea. Um, there are people that want to buy uh, a restaurant, but they have always sold cars. Please learn about the trade that you're going to get into. So in the long, in the short answer is that it really depends on the person. It depends on their, on their capital. It depends on their knowledge. Um, and, and that's why there's so many resources in our community for these people to reach out to UNCC, to learn about their personal journey and maybe talk to Stacy or Laura and find out, am I really cut out to be an entrepreneur? There are people that are great at their trade and they're great about what they like to do, but they don't like to give orders. They don't like to delegate. They don't like to be the person of a corporate mindset to have a business. So, okay, then you cook whatever you love and then hire that general manager to do the hiring and the pricing and the collecting the money. So it's all about taking the time to study yourself, study your idea, how feasible is it? What is your competition? Do you really have clients? Are you going to meet a need and then develop it? So it's like an accordion. It can be starting small and grow it, or sometimes someone buys something that is just so big that they go, okay, let's go, let's, let's, let's focus more on three or four products and become an expert on that. Um, so again, I think, I think the answer would be, it depends. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> you did, you did a wonderful job. So what I'm hearing is there are no overnight successes that you have to put in the work, that you have to do the research. Yeah, I remember um, when I was working and doing, working with small businesses, people used to say, here, can you write my business plan? And I thought to myself, well, no, not really, because I don't know what your dreams and your goals are. Um, so it really does require self-reflection. It requires a lot of research, rolling up your sleeve, no matter what size business you want to have. So thank you for doing a great job of describing that accordion and all, and all of that work. Yeah, so don't, don't wait for someone to do your homework. You, yeah, it's yeah, your, yeah, it's your business, <laughs> it's your money, it's your homework. <laughs> and it's your profit and it's your results and it's your vacation. Right, exactly, exactly. So that leads me to, to talk to Sherry. So Sherry, um, you have birthed um, many babies. Uh, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about um, a Pauline's tea bar and apothecary. Um, what Rocia, Rocia described seems like a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Did it ever mm -hmm. seem overwhelming to you? How did you go about the different phases of of growing your baby into a business it, with two locations and um, just a safe space and a wonderful community space for entrepreneurs and individuals and organizations. Well, thank you for asking that question. And just like Stacy said, um, on, this found me, this um, social entrepreneurship journey definitely found it me. I, I have embraced personal stewardship for a long, long time. And part of stewarding what, what you have and, and those visions and those things that are planted in your heart to birth means being true to who you are and being true to the values. So when I launched the Pauline T Bar Apothecary, I, um, I was not thinking about earning a profit or making money. It was truly about offering something very countercultural to the community that was needed. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, wellness and self care was, is, is a big part of what our culture needs. Um, and so, being a, a chaplain, um, I think I was able to, as I put in the chat, put um, some healthy boundaries around. Um, what I needed to do so that it didn't become overwhelming. So our values are a restorative um, environment, a peaceful presence, uh, meaningful connections and gracious hospitality. I focus specifically on those things. And when 
the number of people that came with ideas and, and advice, you know, uh, very well-meaning people uh, with advice in the beginning, if it didn't align with any of those values, it, was, it made it easier for me to say no. It made it easier for me to put up a healthy boundary in that's, that doesn't fit our model. And I think in doing that, um, we have been able to create, curate a space that uh, still offers that uh, for people. Um, the biggest compliment that I get is I still have people to walk into the T-Bar, our first location every day and excel. That is how I know that we're doing it right. Um, the second location came to us. <laughs> I was not, I was totally fine with not having, with being the best little Pauline T-Bar um, here in West Charlotte that I could be. Uh, but when the VAPA Center board started thinking about what would be the best thing to offer the guests um, as far as a food and beverage vendor, uh, they said, our artists drink tea. And so they came to me with this opportunity. And it was, it was something I couldn't turn down. I mean, they made it so it, it fit, it aligned with our values. Um, the space was small enough that we could care for people um, and offer, offer a, a sip of, um, of respite in a beautiful space of art. Um, so I think that's necessary um, is really knowing what your values, values are, staying authentic to that and uh, being able to offer the same self-care that we, we as, as uh, women uh, talk about with, with everyone else, offering that to ourselves. Thank you so much, Sherry. I really appreciate hearing more about how you were able to keep true to your values and make it a space that you wanted to be in and a business that you wanted to run um, in, while creating an environment for your customers. Stacy um, asked, uh, who is Pauline? I should have I should have started with that, Arisa. Um, <laughs> Pauline was my grandmother. So uh, I wanted to continue her legacy of, of opening up her porch and her living room um, to the community. And so that's that's my mom, my grandmother's name. Thank you, uh, Sherry. So we we have about 20 minutes left. Um, and I have a question that um, anyone can ask. I'll ask Stacy to start, but um, anyone can answer this question. Um, when we think about entrepreneurship as being kind of an opportunity for economic empowerment, no matter where you are as a woman in your life, uh, what are some of the trends or what are some of the opportunities, um, whether it be types of products or types of business, that you're seeing, that you're hearing about, or that you wish you could, you know, have yourself. So if I think, okay, well, I know that there are a lot of self-care items that really uh, made it, you know, made lots of profits during COVID because, you know, we really need, need it and still need to take care of ourselves. But what are some of the emerging markets and products that you all are hearing about? So I'll, I'll start with my own experience and uh, two, two things that I think can be helpful here when you're trying to figure out where your little niche in the world is. I think when you get uh, really still and think about the problem only you can solve. And a lot of times it's the combination of your gifts and natural abilities. Also some of the hurdles you've been through in your life. And then how that presents itself for your sphere of influence. What does that look like? And what I started to find was that little nudge just kept coming back to me. Like I knew how passionate I was about mentorship, but I was like, oh, no one else will get that. No, you know, it's, it, I ignored it for too long until the point where I started having these conversations with people who said, oh my goodness, that's such a solution I need. And every time I had that conversation, it just ignited passion again. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm on the right path. And so I, I loved what Sherry was saying about 
you know, you, as an entrepreneur, especially in the early days, you have to change your measure of success because it isn't going to be title or salary, all those things that were success in corporate America. Now you have to come up with what it was. And so for me, it was every single day when I would have a conversation and somebody said, I get it, I need it. And I was like, all right, I'll keep plodding along. Mm -hmm. And in that plodding along, some of the things that Rocia was saying are, do you need to build it and create it? Or can you con contribute to a solution that's already in the market? And too often we think, ah, oh, this idea is my baby. I got to bring this to life. When there may be some like complementary service or industry or partner that can make the work a whole lot easier. So, you know, the first thing would be, what's that little nudge that you constantly are reminded of? And then do you build it or do you contribute to it in a different way? And I think if you're building it, it's a longer runway to revenue generation. And so you have to be prepared for that. That's a family, you know, decision. That's a, that's gonna hit your family budget and everyone needs to know that and be on board for that. And it also is a lot of sacrifice in the beginning. And I think people underestimate, you know, what you're really sacrificing to start something from scratch. Certainly um, a lot of sacrifice. Laura or Rocio, uh, well, add to that? Yes, if I may, I am going to be very short about this because actually, um, from, from the pandemic and the economic downturn, we have seen a lot of different industries and specific services that are meeting the needs of the current um, uh, clientele. And, and these industries, we see that there's actually a list of services that have been able to flourish and businesses that have been able to flourish because of the current uh, economic state. So I have a quick uh, list and then I would love to hear what Laura has to also include. Um, We've seen a big influx and in growth in businesses in consulting, in social media, marketing, HR, leadership, uh, digital marketing. So consulting would be one. The other one on uh, online reselling, online trading, online teaching, online bookkeeping and admin support. Uh, courier. So we have courier delivery of services, of food, of packages in the medical field. There's a lot of need to have uh, courier services for that. Um, application development, transcription services. So if you are really good at typing and you want to work from home, now that a lot of females needed to stay home with their children, if you're good at typing, you can do uh, medical transcriptions, um, professional organizing, residential or commercial cleaning, freelance consulting and writing. And um, this is also because of the translation services and the global economy that we're entering that has become another way to enter into entrepreneurship. Home care services, a lot of seniors want to stay home and those businesses that are providing home care services are flourishing. And also food trucks. You've seen a ton of food trucks out there. I mean, it's easier to purchase a food truck than a restaurant, although there's a lot of legalities behind it. Um, but that's my, that's my list of industries that have benefited from what is happening right now. I would definitely, yeah, I, I, my big one I was going to just talk about was health tech, like really like getting into that field, like when you're talking about the disruption and where they're looking for solutions, like that's just where I've seen. And then also sustainability. It's amazing, um, especially students on campus that want to get involved in environmental sustainability issues. Like that is sort of, they're really wanting to look at that, that social aspect. Um, so, so much to an extent, I say, you know, we are the, you know, we're the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center. Um, but I also, when I'm talking with students and directly, like I almost say, how do you want to make an impact? Because entrepreneurship is very loaded for a lot of students right now. You know, that's just what I found through my customer discovery. And so it's almost showing them how to be and on, you know, what that actually entails. Um, so I think really, you know, and a lot of it as Stacy and then I think Sherry and I think and Rocio, both all three of us, all three of you guys agreed not to reinvent the wheel. Um, a lot of students will come to us. And then a lot when I worked with community members as well, but coming with this idea. And the biggest thing is 
what else is out there. Even if it's nothing, then apathy is your competitor because why is it something being done? You know, why is nobody approaching that? So it's really trying to figure out that niche, that where, where is that gap and why is there a gap? And so I think it's, I, I love partnerships, especially when you're starting out. If you can find somebody to partner with or to coincide with or to coexist with, because again, you're not reinventing that wheel. You're not trying to immediately, you know, because, you know, a lot of people go, oh, I can beat them. Like they're doing this and I'm not going to do that. Well, they're already established. So why are they established and why are they succeeding? And how, what aren't they offering that you may be able to offer? So I think that's important. Um, so I think that's a wide way of really loving the list that Rosia just went through and um, going through with, uh, you know, and just really talking about what, else, what is out there and how can you make that impact. Thank you. So would anyone else like to add to that? Um, I, I'd like to just piggyback on what Laura said about the partnerships that that was very key to me as well in this business model. I, I, I had the T sourced. Um, but I wanted to also help other business women, uh, business um, women owners. Um, and so we have our, our uh, pastries are coming from a local um, organization that helps women, a nonprofit organization that helps women with uh, culinary arts and helps them with um, getting back on their feet again. Um, that's uh, one of our philanthropic arms. Uh, we have a baker that uh, makes these herb infused sugar cubes that our patrons love adding into their sugars. Um, one of my hospitality hostesses is actually an herbalist. Um, so empowering her uh, to come and get alongside what we're doing has um, boosted her business. Um, so that, that is really, really key is partnering, knowing that you can't and shouldn't try to do it all. But um, give, if you have a piece of the pie that will empower and bring, uh, bridge someone else up to success, that's important. And I think that's been a part of our success is working, uh, working with other business uh, leaders. Thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to check the chat to see if we have any questions that have come through. I see some very compliments of uh, complimentary words to our panelists. I don't see any additional questions. So um, because we are near our time to wrap up, I would like each of you to share one or two top tips that you think will benefit someone who is either thinking about starting a business or someone who wants to expand their business. Um, and anyone can start and we'll just kind of go through the panel and get your comments or your thoughts. I will say, um, I think we've all said this in one of our answers, but have the conversation, go take those steps to sort of, you know, test those waters and nothing is going to be perfect. It's not, I'm going to wait until this time to do this, or I need for A, B, and C to be in line to do any, that's never going to happen. Like it's, you know, we, we deal with so many things as, as females, we're coming and going and doing there is never going to be a perfect time. So as the thought does, all I will say is raise your hand and talk about it. Have that conversation with whoever, any of us, anybody that you, you know, that you're just bouncing an idea off of, but just take that. Yes. Raise your hand. Absolutely. Because I feel that's the one thing as females, we do not do enough of. Um, again, everything has to be perfect and, you know, we want to make sure everything is aligned. So that would be mine. So I will pass it off. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. I'll go next. I would like to uh, go the route of the finances. It doesn't matter whether you start a business or you want to scale a business. You need to, um, you need to review your personal finances and your business finances. How much capital do you have to invest in the business? and continue to provide for yourself and your family. And if you want to expand your business, how are you going to um, ensure that your current business is not unattended while you invest and grow the business? So always check your finances and uh, seek advice. That's why we have a lot of 
these resources. You don't have to do this alone. There's resources everywhere to help you in the financial field, marketing, everything. So check check your finances um, before any type of idea or or before in, taking any steps into entrepreneurship or growing your business. Uh, I this is going to sound different than what I said earlier about uh, knowing your why and having um, being true to your values. Um, but I will also say be open, um, be be open to other ideas and be open to um, to innovation. Um, it, it's know that you don't know everything <laughs> and it's okay. I like that, uh, Laura, be coachable, be willing to um, flow with it. And, and, and that you may be surprised at what comes out of uh, moving in that way. Oh, I, I can echo everything you all are saying. And I, I think the, the piece of advice that I have is be really intentional about what your what skills you're developing. And my example is I thought my business was going to be a piece of tech software. So in the first year, I studied funding. I pitched at all these places. I, I did all these things looking for co-founders. I did all these things because I saw other people doing these things. And I over, I didn't even think about bootstrapping, like bootstrapping my business. And then I own it all and I can do with what I want with the profits. I could create a piece of software and it's mine. And so I think everyone else's plan is not yours. And Sherry, you're a hundred percent right. I think in the early stages, you want to say yes and be open to everything. And then once you have your vision, it's about saying no and no, this is, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to plot this path on my own because this is, this, this is what was destined for me. And, and that why piece is so, so important. I love Sherry that your, your business is a legacy to your grandmother, because I find in entrepreneurs, the businesses that really stick, the, the original idea isn't what lasts but it's the why that always is two responses deeper than your initial response. So when somebody asks you why, give yourself two more why, why, and I am right there with you, Sherry. Legacy, I'm driven by legacy. Mm -hmm. I, I want to leave this world better than how I found it. And I can do that through the mentorship experience. So I'm gonna share my, my contact information and anybody who's looking for a mentor or more information about how to find mentorship, I'm happy to connect. And I believe many of you have added your contact information. Um, as we wrap up, please continue to add your contact information so that um, those listeners and viewers can get in touch with you. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful panel. I just have a couple of notes that I want to highlight. This has been so informative. It's been a great conversation and very inspirational. Um, so, you know, we, we heard um, Stacy talk about the power of your peer group and really leveraging your network as you consider entrepreneurship. We heard Rosario talk to us about the many different opportunities, no matter what level you're thinking of, that there are many emerging markets for us to consider. Um, Sherry, thank you so much for reminding us about boundaries, that you have to have your, your, your personal and your professional boundaries. Um, as entrepreneurs, you don't always chase any and every opportunity, but then at the same time, be open to opportunities that may present, become presented to you. Um, Laura, you talked a lot about innovation and being open to innovation and opportunities. I love how you talk about the students and as they think about you know being socially engaged and active that they also consider opportunities whether it's health tech or whether it's looking at a way to take their whatever they're passionate about gather and gain more information by working with you and then create something new in the world um, I um, have learned a lot I've met some new friends and I'm looking forward to my um, new network and for anyone listening or watching, 
please continue to um, do your research, but work with any of the panelists and any of the information you heard today. Um, we will all present our contact information so that you can get in touch with, with us. Um, there is a survey that will be sent out to you so that you can give the Women and Girls Research Alliance, Dr. Meg's information to continue to grow the, the uh, content and the program. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Michelle Meggs. I would like to thank the panelists for this wonderful opportunity to um, hear information, but also moderate the flow of discussion. Um, at this point, uh, Dr. Meggs, is there anything that you'd like to uh, share with us before we close out? Again, I just want to reiterate my thanks and my gratitude for this wonderful panel. Thank you for sharing um, all of your information. And, and again, I, uh, you gave us a lot of takeaways, a lot to think about, uh, knowing your why, knowing the resources, the importance of a mentor, being open, knowing your boundaries. Um, you all have shared so much. Thank you so much for sharing your time. I really do appreciate it. This was a phenomenal panel and I knew that it would be. So thank you, Stacy, Sherry, Rocio, Laura, and Arissa. Thank you so much. Um, please, uh, this uh, is being recorded. It will be posted to the Women and Girls Research Alliance uh, web webpage uh, for those uh, who would like to watch it again. Um, and again, just to pull again from all of the knowledge that was shared. Again, thank you to Natasha Stranser with the IELTS Group for, and her staff for all of their help uh, with the technology for this workshop. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again um, at our next workshop. And thank you again so much for joining us. We wish you well and have a wonderful week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>